Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Today, we're going to study on the New Testament. I mean, we're going to study on the first four Gospels. So before we could start with our session, can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Let's pray. Yes. Father, we want to thank you for this time. Lord, we submit us to your mighty presence. Lord, we pray that you would enable us to understand from your scriptures. And we pray for us, Diana, to explain your word and in its fullness, oh God, and open our eyes to understand the mysteries. We pray that this session will be a real blessing to each one of us. Help us to draw more close to you, Lord. We thank yes. you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Well, <clears throat> before we could start, we can keep our Bibles also handy with us so that we can study and we can keep things noted on the Bible itself as we study the Gospels. Well, I'll just give a brief recap of the Jewish history that we covered before. So, just a glance of what happened in the book till the book of Malachi so that we will understand better before we could step into the New Testament. So what happened here is uh, when we study uh, the Jewish history, we see that there was a rebuilding of the temple following the exile of the Jewish people in Babylon in the year 586 BC. And this was completed by 516 BC. And we see the next century saw the reforms of the two leaders under the two leaders, that is Ezra and Nehemiah. So the biblical scholars also agree with Nehemiah that he restored the walls of Jerusalem uh, in 444 BC and the temple was restored back. And then Ezra came under the leadership and he, uh, he restored the temple practices, the sacrifices, and uh, he also taught the laws of Torah. And Ezra, uh, he came to Jerusalem in 457 BC during the seventh year, the reign of King Artaxerxes. And we studied that in the book of Ezra. And he also collaborated under the leadership with Nehemiah. And during this period, we had a contemporary prophets. And the last prophet was Malachi. Well, he came in condemning the sins of an unrepented nation. The people who were practicing, worshipping the pagan god. And including the priests who were corrupt. So through the teaching of Ezra, the law and the practices that he taught, there was a small remnant of people continued to follow the footsteps and teaching of Ezra and Nehemiah. So keeping this in mind, we also see that in Palestine, during this obscure period of 400 silent years, or the dark period we call it, the Jews and the Samaritans were there. There were two groups, Jews and Samaritans. And they became religiously strong. They hated each other equally. And they were ethnically separated. So we see also uh, this fact has been uh, uh, repeated. Or we see that when we uh, read the Gospels. And during this time, we also see there's a language called Aramaic began to replace the Hebrew as their vernacular language. Now, keeping this as a background, we can step into the New Testament. So is it clear? Do you, have, do you all have any questions? Or we can move on. To the introduction of the four gospel. Let's move on. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the four gospels from the New Testament, 
when we read all these four, yes, we see that they are united in their intent. But there's something unique in their perspective, where they have portrayed the gospel. The writer presented in a different picture of life and the work of Jesus. Here is how we see the four evangelists announcing the good news of Jesus. And they call people to believe in him. And in the story of the birth, the life, the teaching, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Well, in the New Testament, it consists of 27 books with a varied character. The first five books listed in the content, in the table of content in the New Testament, we see that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John and the book of Acts are known as the historical. It's been divided into three sections. First is the first five books are historical books so that you can make a note in the table of contents on your Bible. The first five books in the New Testament, that is from Matthew to the, to the Acts, which is known as the historical. And the next, the 21 books, that is from the book of Romans till the book of Jude, are called as epistolary contains of uh, the, Pau the Pauline epistle and the individual epistles. And the last one is prophetical, that is the book of Revelation. With this, we see that each gospel deals uniquely. And it is well known, uh, the facts have been well recorded, told and retold in the first century why was it told and retold? Can anyone tell me why was it again and again repeated in the four Gospels? Yes, please go ahead, Brother Lubega. I think it is not repeated. It's the... Uh... According to me, I think God just needed to give us a different perspective. Because you see, when we talk about the story of Jesus Christ, this is the best story that has been ever told. So you find that this was written for different people. But I think God as an individual wanted, or oh, oh, God as a divine being, wanted to yeah. give us different views. Like uh, you see a 2D picture is different from a 3D picture. And when we talk about Jesus Christ, we are talking about a 4D. So I think that's the major reason why it is written like that, but it's not repeated. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, Brother Lubega. Lubega yes, right. But it has been retold with a different perspective. Yes. And we also see very important thing here is the four other eyewitnesses. Each written by a person who was an eyewitness to the most of the events that has been described or who had carefully questioned the other eyewitnesses. So the four Gospels here, and all have the common elements and not the same. So each one have shaped for a different audience, has said, in, and each have a slightly different slant to the greatest story which has been ever told. Well, we see Matthew provides us uh, provides us with a careful proof to show that it has been uh, uh, it has been written to the Jewish readers that Jesus truly did fulfill the words of the Old Testament prophets, and we also find that Jesus. Uh, this book shows that Jesus as the sovereign King, the Lord prophesied through the Old Testament prophets, and we also see that Matthew emphasizes the fact that Jesus is the messianic savior and has come to earth to lead his kingdom. As Matthew portrays it this way, as Jesus as the king, Mark depicts Jesus as the servant of all, the one sent by God to serve his people and to submit himself to the Father's will. The submission was so much that even to his death, and in this book, we also see that we find um, 
Jesus, though he was a king, he actually took the form of a servant willing to suffer for the purpose of God. As Mark shared that, we also see Luke equally and carefully presenting Jesus. He speaks to the Hellenistic world, revealing that Jesus is a historical rather than a mythical figure. Jesus is seen as a savior for all mankind. And we also uh, find him as human, as a human in instance such as, uh, you know, uh, in the nativity as well as a reference to Jesus' genealogy being tracked back to Adam. And as Luke portrayed that way, we see John presents Jesus as I am the living, the perfectly divine son of God. He also goes up to the creation. He says he is the word of God, the creator who breathed life into the world and who still works among us, through us, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, with these four accounts emphasizing a different portrayal of Jesus, we can also see more of his completion, his beauty, his dimension, div divinity. So the gospel are intended to reveal God in his fullness. And we see that when we read the gospel, each book. In other words, we also see that uh, the account has been rather than comparing them side by side. We can read them. So the three of the four Gospels are closely linked by the content and by the manner of way it has been expressed. Like the Matthew, Mark and Luke. These three Gospels are also called as the synoptic Gospels from a Greek term meaning common view. Again, I repeat, Matthew, Mark and Luke are called as the synoptic Gospels from a Greek term meaning common view. So the early church concentrated on relating these events and sayings of Jesus as a spread story outward from Palestine. And many events would be told and retold word by word, typically for the poetry and the tradition of the days that they lived in. Also, the author of these synoptics knew one another and surely would have shared their memories with each other. So with that, can we have a question? We may have a question saying that, what does the term gospel mean? Can anyone say, answer that? What does the term gospel mean? I think it means good news. Yes. Thank you, brother. Yes. While Jesus probably spoke Aramaic in those times because that was the vernacular language. The New Testament was written in Greek. And the English term comes from the old English called God spell, G-O-D-S-P-E-L-L, -L, God spell, a translation of the Greek known as Evangelion or Eungelion. God spell, a Greek translation, a Greek noun, means eungelion. And eungelion means good tidings or good news. And it, it eventually, eventually it termed for good news about Jesus Christ. And when we see study the history of New Testament, some of the scholars say that during the time of New Testament world, the term accompanies the announcements about victory in the battle or the enthronement of a Roman ruler. They would have an inscription for the birthday of the Roman Emperor Augustus reads as good news, that is, eungelia to the world. And in the Old Testament, good news sometimes referred to God's deliverance of his people. Good news referred to in the olden days as 
God's deliverance of his people. Now, we also see some of the references in the book of Isaiah. Can I request one of us to read Isaiah 52 verse 7? Okay, there are three references. Can I request one of them to take up Isaiah 52 verse 7 and the other to take up Isaiah 40 verse 9 and the next one is Isaiah 61 verse 1. I'll just type these scriptures for us. Isaiah 52, 7. Isaiah 40, verse 9. And Isaiah, Isaiah 62, 61. verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. Amen. Amen. Next, Isaiah 40, verse 9. Isaiah 40, verse 9. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountain tops, shout it louder, O Jerusalem, shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. Amen. Next, Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord, God is upon me. Because the Lord had anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he had sent me to bind up the broken hearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, and opening of the prison to them that are bound. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So in all these three scriptures, we see that. We see that. In the first scripture, we see that how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring the good news. And even in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9, we see that you who bring good news to Jerusalem. And again, in Isaiah 61, verse 1, we read that the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. So this good news in the Old Testament times referred to God's deliverance of his people. The gospel, though historically refers to the facts of the death, burial and the resurrection of Christ. Doctrinally, it refers to the interpretation and the application of these facts. So that is, there is one gospel. Can I request one of us to read Galatians chapter 1, verse 6? Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. There are some scriptures that we can refer to as we study. Galatians. I marvel that chapter 1, verse 6, no ma'am? Yes, chapter 1, verse 6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. So here we see that there is only one gospel. There is no different gospel. We should not turn away to any other gospel. It is called the gospel of God, the gospel of the grace of God, which emphasizes that it originates in God and his grace. We also see that it is also called the gospel of Christ or the gospel of the glory of Christ to emphasize that it comes to man through Christ. We see that in Romans 15, 19. Can I request one of us to turn to Romans 15, verse 19. Romans chapter 15, verse 19. Romans 15 verses 19 <clears throat> by the power of signs and miracles through the power of the spirit so from Jerusalem all the way around the Ilricum, Ilricum. I, have, 
I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ. So here we see it has been called as the gospel of Christ. And the other scriptures in the book of 2 Corinthians, when we read, we see that Paul saying that the gospel of the glory of Christ. And he emphasizes on that. Can I request one of us to turn to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35? Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. But the Pharisees said, He can cast out demons because he is empowered by the prince of demons. Jesus, can I know which verse? 35, right? 35, yes. Jesus traveled through all the towns and the villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. Thank you. Can one of us turn to Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, and the other person turn to John chapter 3, verse 5, please? Matthew 4, 23, and Gospel of John chapter 3, verse 5. Matthew, Matthew 4, 23. Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogue, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And heal all the manner of sickness, all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Thank you. Can I get anyone to read John chapter three verse five, please? John chapter Jesus three answered. verse five. Jesus answered, "Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God." Amen. Thank you. So what we see here. Here we see the gospel has been called as the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of salvation, or the gospel of peace, which emphasizes that those who believe in it enters God's kingdom and receive eternal salvation and peace. We see how the three emphasize, emphasis in this. First has been called as the gospel of God or the gospel of grace. And the second we see the gospel of Christ or the gospel of the glory of Christ. And third, we see that it has been called as the gospel of the kingdom or the gospel of salvation and the gospel of peace. So we see the three emphasis on, the, on these four gospels. We also see that uh, the gospel is a miniature we see that in one single verse. Can I request one of us to turn to John chapter 3, verse 16? I'm sure for most of us, the scripture is by heart. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Amen. The gospel is preached in this one single scripture, which declares saying, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We see the Greek word evangelion soon became a technical term for the good news of Jesus Christ. Can I request one of us to please turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5 For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Amen. 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 Yes. Yes. So here we see that Paul writes that a gospel came to you not simply with words 
but also with power with the holy spirit and with deep conviction very very important so this is one of the earliest new testament letters and paul uses eungelion for the oral proclamation of the good news about jesus christ so eventually eungelion was used to describe the written version of the good news about jesus christ well we see mark introduces his works with the words as he starts his gospel he writes the beginning of the gospel about jesus christ the son of god and we see that the church eventually came to call all of these four gospels as the all of these four accounts as the gospel the term gospel tells us how the early church viewed these works these were in dry historical accounts of the life of christ but it was a written versions of the greatest news ever shared or ever told so what is it gospel are meant to be proclaimed believed told and retold till date this is what we are doing this is what we are doing we are carrying the word that is the great commission that has been shared by jesus christ to each one of us in matthew 28 that we need to proclaim this good news to the ends of the earth till date there are many 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 people have given their life to the gospel of christ there are persecution even in our times many places just not only in india even in other countries we see this persecution there is always there's something against the gospel against this good news but then nothing has stopped nothing has stopped so the genre of the gospels how are we to classify the text it determines how we read it and what we can expect from it there are three things one the first one when we pick up a newspaper what we expect to read from a newspaper latest news no the latest news or when we pick up a tabloid we expect some kind of gossip and that or if we pick up a novel story what do we expect from that some fiction some moments reading that story however when we pick up these four gospels we get to read the life the teaching the death the burial of jesus christ you also see that the gospel are the historical literature the first is they have said a history of composition where the book has been structured the authors drew the traditional resources and how they have compiled it the second it says they are set in a specific historical context each of the four gospel took place in the first century during the palestine and the roman occupation and the third point we see here is meant to convey the historical accurate information the details included in the gospel the way it has been written and organized and then the similarities in composing implies us that it is a accurate information john and luke state that the intentions the luke leaves no doubt that he intend to write the history of the gospel can i request one of us to please turn to luke chapter 1 verse 1 to 4 please Ma'am, Luke chapter one verses one to four. Yes, please. 
many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eye witnesses and servants of the word therefore since i myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you most excellent theophilus so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught thank you thank you so we see here luke claimed to be writing an accurate history he could question whether he was uh, he was a reliable historian or whether his sources were reliable but the point is that his intentions were historical whether or not these events actually happened or confirms or denies the truth of christianity we see christianity rises or falls on the historical accuracy the key gospel events on the three things that is the first is jesus words and his deeds the death on the cross the third point is his resurrection all these three actually happen and there were many who i witnessed it can i request one of us to please turn to first corinthians chapter 15 verse 14 First Corinthians, chapter fifteen, verse fourteen. First Corinthians, chapter fifteen, verses fourteen. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so far is your faith. Amen. So Paul writes very clearly: If Christ has not been raised, if Christ has not been raised then our preaching is useless and so is our faith so it is very important that facts and there's a historical confirmation that is there so with this we also see that a gospel is true and when we compare it we can compare it to the four gospels how they compare each other to whom it was written so each of the gospel brings out a unique aspect of jesus identity and we see that in each of these gospel how they introduce their work matthew chapter 1 verse 1 can i request one of us to read matthew chapter 1 verse 1 and the other person take up matthew mark chapter 1 verse 1 the next person take luke chapter 1 verse 3 and the next person take john chapter 1 verse 1 Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 This is the record of the ancestor of Jesus the Messiah a descendant of David and Abraham Thank you next Mark Mark, chap- Mark chapter 1 verse 1 The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the son of God Luke chapter 1 verse 3 Luke chapter 1 and verses 3 Therefore since I myself I have fully investigated everything from the beginning it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you most excellent theophilus thank you john chapter 1 verse 1 john chapter 1 verses 1 In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Thank you. Thank you. So here we see each one emphasizing on Jesus Christ. Well we see Mark emphasizes Jesus as a Christ and the son of God. Matthew jumps into Jesus Jewish ancestry focusing on how Jesus fulfills the promise made to Israel. and we see luke tells as that he wants to write an accurate historical account about jesus 
and John introduces Jesus as a pre-existent divine word, the self-revelation of God. So when we see the gospel writers as the theologian, is important application for the way we read their account. Now we need to read each gospel seeking to discern these theological themes. Now, can we question, are the gospel ancient biographies? There's a consensus agreement growing among the scholars today that while the gospel are unique, they also have a lot in common with the Greco-Roman work, especially the genre known as the biographies or the lives. So these works were written to preserve the memory and celebrate the virtues, teachings and exploits of the famous philosopher's statements or the rulers. And at the same time, we have to remember that the Gospels are unique. They arose in the context of the need and concern of the early Christian communities. And they weren't written to memor uh, you know, to be uh, memorialized the teaching of a great leader, but the Gospels were written to proclaim the good news of salvation, to call people to faith in Jesus Christ, who was the risen Lord and Savior who died for us. So why do we have four gospel? We may have a question. Why not one? Why did the canon consider the four gospels? Or when there are other gospels, why did they only choose Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Why not the gospel of Peter? Or why not the gospel of the other disciples who were with Jesus? Why just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Do we have an answer for that? Have we given a thought on this before? Anyone can answer by just four. Um, could be the Holy Spirit decided. Yeah. So um, the early church attempt to synthesize all these four gospels into one. Into uh, it is uh, one is the dietrician, compiled by the church father Titian around AD one seventy. So. Tatian brought a portion of all four Gospels together into one story. And there have been many attempts to synthesize the Gospels into a single story since then. But in the end, the Church recognized that each Gospel was unique literature account and an inspired and author authoritative work of the Holy Spirit, as you said. So they tried to retain the uniqueness of these four Gospels. There are more than uh, the four ancient document which claims to be the Gospel or which can contain the stories of Jesus, including the work, the, uh, the work of the Gospel. There may be the other Apostles also have, would, have, would have given a written note, a written Gospel like uh, Thomas or Peter, or it can be any anyone else among the twelve. But then they considered the four of them because the facts was matching with all four. So the canon considered the four. Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Because of the unique portrayal where the Matthew represents Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, the fulfillment of the Old Testament hopes. And Mark portrays uh, Jesus as a suffering son of God who offers himself as a sacrifice for sins. Again, relating to the Old Testament. 
and Luke, Jesus is a savior for all people who brings salvation to all nation and people's group, again fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament. And in John we see that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, the self-revelation of God the Father. So having all these four Gospels uh, gives us a deeper and more profound understanding of Jesus is, and who Jesus is and uh, what he did and also the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. So the canon considered these four gospel and unique in nature. They didn't uh, put them all together, but then they retained all these four gospel in the way it was written for the unique purpose. Mm. Yeah. So the key takeaway from these four Gospels, we can see that the Gospel were carefully brought together, again, uh, brought together and uh, vectored against a body of the early church literature. And the four Gospels in the Bible are the most historically accurate, divinely inspired account of Jesus Christ. And also it confirms that the good news of Jesus Christ is the only good news if it's true. Because for two millennia, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John have been used to inspire billions of people to believe in Jesus and the salvation that he brings. And each of them has unique things to show us about his life and the ministry and the teaching of Jesus, what it means to follow him. And each of them has understood and stood the test of times. The greater value of these Gospels provides information. The first three centuries of the church history, especially the second century moment known as the Gnosticism. Some people claim that the Orthodox Church suppressed and silenced the Apocrypha Gospels which depict the real Jesus, but the argument doesn't hold up there. Like the most modern scholars said that the church rejected these writings because they failed the test of the historical veracity and because they lacked the spiritual power and the authority that indicated the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So in short, there were other gospels then they could not relate it with the Old Testament scripture, so they retained these four Gospels. So that the key takeaway, we can see that the Holy Spirit inspired and the Gospel was very carefully put together and formed by the canon, by the early church. And the four gospel together this good news to the end of the world. With this, we will we will stop this session on the introduction of the four Gospels of the New Testament. And from next class onwards, that is from next week onwards, we will study on each letter, on each book. We will start with the Gospel of Matthew and then we will move on to the next, uh, to all the 27 books. Okay, with that, I uh, will keep the session open. Next 10 minutes for the class, you can share, add, or ask questions if there's any. We also see, um, uh, let me share the screen, some of the unique features that has been there in the notes. I request you all to please go through our notes. Always uh, there's a difference. 
when we go through our notes again and again, the learning is much. So I would request each of us to please go through our notes, read so that we get the detailed information. What we share in the class is what is very important. We share it in the class. But then when we read, it helps us. So here we see the distinct features. It's on page 23. We see Matthew is the only gospel containing the word church. And Matthew records the five great sermons shared by Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, the sending of the twelve, the parable of the kingdom, the seven vows on scribes and Pharisees. And the fifth is the Olivet Discourse on the End Times, the study of the end times. And we also see Matthew is the most systematic gospel, which uh, similar things of discourse, parables, and the miracles listed. Matthew also emphasizes on the final rewards and the punishment. The words such as judgment, hell, fire, hypocrite, or wow are found in this book. We also see the comparison with the other four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Portray of Christ. When we see that Matthew portrays Jesus as the king and the lion-like, and Mark portrays servant like an ox, and Luke, perfect person like us, a man figure, a human. And John, mighty God and eagle-like. Now, while these four Gospels portrays, Matthew portrays like a lion, Mark, like an ox, Luke, like a man, and John, like an eagle. So all these four creatures, what does it recollect us? Where do we find these four living creatures, the emphasis on them? Do you recollect any instance? We also covered about this when we studied um, the Old Testament. Um, when the Israelites were divided into four groups and they had this on their flags. Yes, yes, Jeffina, thank you. The Israelites were defeated in the camping site, uh, keeping the tabernacle in, in between. And there were four, uh, four tri uh, I mean, uh, the 12 tribes were settling down in four groups. So each one having a banner. We see the Judah carrying the banner of lion. And then the other tribe carrying the banner of an ox and the other one having the banner of man and the other having the Dan having the banner of an eagle. The same way we also see that the same four creature reflection in the book of Revelation in the throne of God. Lion, ox, man and eagle featuring there. And we see in the book of Matthew, the angelic reminder all, on all these four Gospels, the angelic reminder, the first creature lion-like, then the ox, the man, and an eagle. The style of the writer in all these three, the Matthew portrays like a teacher, the Mark portrays preacher, and the Luke historian, and John is a theologian. So we see the different way the four gospel has been accounted. And as we come down, we see the outline of Matthew, the advent of the king, the announcer of the king, and the approval of the king. And the second part, we see the background for the sermon. And some of the titles that we could pick from here, the Sermon on the Mount, and the other part, the third part, we see that the demonstration of the king's power, the delegation of king's power. And part four, we see the commencement of rejection with the rejection of John the Baptist, Jesus' generation, and others following the rejection of Christ by the Pharisees, the consequences of the rejection, the continuing rejection of the king. We also, I request you all to please go through it. Lord's Prayer. Then go through all these, which gives us 
the parable of the kingdom, the parable, the expected form, unexpected form, gives us a detailed information. So we have a week's time now from today. So I request you all to please go through the outline of the four Gospels, which will help us to study in deep so that this will help us to be prepared as we study the Gospel in each individual so that we can understand it better. So with this, I end this session. And I request one of us, uh, okay, uh, one of us to lead us, uh, one of us to end this session with a word of prayer, please. Let's pray. Yes, yes. Father pray. Almighty, Let's King pray. of Glory. Father, we give you thank, we give you praise, we worship you, adore you, and I lift your name so high. Thank you for your word. We pray that your word bear fruit in us. It brings us wisdom, it brings us knowledge. We surrender this lesson and the, the ones that are coming into your hand that you lead us to be successful. In Jesus Christ's name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you. To answer to Rosalind's question, I'll just give you the page details. Got it, ma'am. No. You got it, yeah. It is in the introduction of the New Testament for Gospels. You can go through it and also go through the Gospel of Matthew so that we are prepared when we study in the next class. Thank you so much. God bless. See you all next week. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. God bless.